This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to The Commercial Investing Show, where we analyze, explain, and exploit the opportunities presented in today's commercial property marketplace. If you're interested in apartments, mobile home parks, self-storage facilities, and other income property, you've come to the right place. We'll explore what's hot and what's not in markets nationwide in the relentless pursuit of return on investment. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. It's my pleasure to welcome Andrew Rybczynski to the show. He is a senior consultant at CoStar Portfolio Strategy, and we're going to talk about housing today. Andrew, welcome. How are you? Not bad, Jason. Thanks for having me. Good. Good to have you. So a lot of stuff has been going on in the crazy, possibly very frothy uh, real estate market as coming out of the Great Recession. Institutional investors, uh, there's just a lot of money sloshing around uh, looking for yield. We've seen a lot of construction in brand new A-class uh, multifamily housing all around the country. It, it feels like every city I go to there's cranes everywhere, right? Is that subsiding or how, how's the supply demand outlook? So we certainly have seen a lot of uh, construction of top end apartment buildings this cycle. And your feeling on a lot of cranes in the sky is uh, well placed. Right now, we actually have the largest number of uh, units under construction this cycle, uh, topping out about 650,000 units under construction right now. Now, that's actually kind of an interesting subset of the market in that while we do have a ton of uh, units under construction right now, units completing has actually not really been reflecting that. So the number of units that completed in 2018 was actually down a little bit from uh, the number that completed in 2017, and 2019 isn't off to a great start either. This has affected vacancy, top-line vacancy, and we're talking in early April, so our Q1 uh, preliminary numbers for 2019 are just out. And uh, top-line vacancy in apartment is actually down a little bit from last quarter. And compared to where it was last year, it's actually down quite a bit. A lot of that is due to slower completions of apartment units, especially in that luxury uh, market. So why are those completions and deliveries slower? I know that developers in any part of the marketplace, you know, no matter what they're building, there's definitely a labor shortage Construction materials are always an issue. What what's slowing the delivery, uh, or maybe you know maybe even talk about the financing end too. So as best we can tell, the labor market is the key driver of the slowdown in delivery. Now that's not true everywhere. I've heard anecdotal evidence that one of the major slowdowns in Boston is actually materials related. It can't get enough glass for curtain walls on on high rise apartment buildings. Mm-hmm. But even that plays into a labor shortage. We're at three eight unemployment right now. And the participation rate continues to rise in 25 to 54 year olds. So we're really tapping the bottom of the employment barrel right now. Wage rises have started to reflect that. But the end effect is that there's not, it doesn't seem that there's enough workers to go around to build all these buildings that uh, developers continue to start. And that has had an effect in the length of time that it takes to complete a building. We have noticed an increase in the number of buildings that are taking three years or longer to uh, to complete. So speaking to the, the financing aspect of your question, uh, that does mean that typically with a construction loan uh, lasting about three years, you do have to go back and, and find some new financing. Yeah. So you mentioned, uh, I mean, you're, in, you're located in Boston and you mentioned, you know, glass curtain walls on high rise buildings, but you know, a lot of stuff is just garden style, sticks and bricks type thing. I mean, three years to build high rises like that isn't, well, it's long, but it's not crazy, I guess. But the garden style stuff goes up a lot faster. So how is it in that sector? That's true. And when I cited that rise, I was speaking specifically uh, to garden and uh, mid-rise apartment. Well, I shouldn't say garden because gardens, uh, there's virtually no garden under construction, but the mid-rise sector Um, is really what we look at when we're looking at those increase in number of buildings taking longer than three years to complete. Uh, Because that is 
more likely to have a, a three-year construction loan attached to it. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Okay, good. So those construction loans come due and, you know, they've got to complete and they've got to deliver. Are your clients and, you know, the, the research you're doing, they must be seeing big increases in construction materials costs. You mentioned the glass shortage. Anything else on that? Well, we know copper and steel have both risen in recent years. Steel may be coming back in a little bit, but uh, certainly tariffs have, have bitten on that front. On the uh, demand side, the renter demand side, or tenant supply side, depending on how you want to look at it, I guess, you know, we've seen these interesting trends. It doesn't seem to be that there's much stigma at all toward renting anymore. It's not like you're a loser if you're a renter. But that used to be a little bit of the way people thought of it. The point is to be a homeowner, right? That's always the, the goal. But nowadays, I don't know if that lives like it used to, that American dream concept, and feel free to comment on that. But one of the things that's particularly interesting about the uh, renter population is this baby boomer renter population. I mean, that's a new one, right? That we see baby boomers selling their houses, empty nesting, and then moving into apartments. Uh, and then if you segment the market, you talked about the high end, you know, high rise apartments, which are always high end, you know, maybe talk about the different um, categories of, uh, of renters out there. And then I want to talk about your comment off air about the, you know, people moving down market, uh, the buyers. So the recession hit everyone hard and home ownership rates peaked in around 05. Uh, since then, as you as you mentioned, baby boomers have started shifting towards renting more so than one would expect for that age group. That's been an important uh, aspect of demand, especially for the high-end apartments that we were talking about. Downtown living appeals to not just the younger renter, but the empty nester, as you said. I can't speak to the mentality of whether a renter prefers uh, renting or homeowning or, or any stigma that might be attached to it, but I can tell you that for younger co cohorts who are owning homes at slightly higher shares than they had in the past couple of years, um, we've seen an uptick there. But for younger cohorts, there is still a huge problem of affordability and debt, especially in the older, more educated markets, Boston's and San Francisco's and uh, New York's of the world, where not only do you have to pay that mortgage, but scrape together a tremendous down payment. And in many cases, you're doing that while you are neck high in, in student debt. The student debt story has attracted a lot of attention, but it's it's a very important aspect of the home ownership market. Yeah, as I always say, we've got an entire generation of millennials who have a mortgage, but they didn't get a house included with it. <laughs> it's called a student loan. <clears throat> That's an excellent way to put and, it. And that is an unbelievable scam. The price of college is a total scam. But that's another discussion. <laughs> so, sure. yeah. What else do you want to say about the renter, the supply of renters, the tenant population? By and large, we do think that there's still a pretty good demand pool for renters. There is still a fairly large share of young people who live at home. And that that's don't... sort of the shadow demand, right? And exactly. during the Great Recession, we talked a lot about the shadow supply of all these houses that the lenders weren't foreclosing on because they were just, just doing workouts or just postponing foreclosure or, or they already had them in their REO portfolio. They didn't want to dump them on the market in fear of hurting the market too much. And the government had a lot to say about that too. But now, I mean, it's diminishing a little bit, I guess, as, as people do move out of their house, but there's this shadow demand of, of renters. So, you know, that's interesting on that side of the equation that, you know, live, living at home and 40 years old, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, or, you know, or, or 29, you know, that's unusual too, right? It is. Yeah. But aside from that, uh, we have seen very strong household formation over the past few years mm -hmm. to the point where it's actually keeping up with supply to a large degree. And, and some of that comes back to the fact that we're just not building, especially single family homes, as much as we used to. When you compare the number of single family uh, homes completing this cycle versus last cycle, there's a tremendous disconnect and population growth hasn't fallen off as much as home building has. So we are essentially facing a housing crisis in America. When you say crisis, you mean shortage, right? Shortage, yeah, I should say. Right, yeah. right. Single family investors, make sure you heard that because it is definitely true. The inventory coming out of the Great Recession especially on the low end, these nice bread and butter type rental properties that, you know, all investors love, 
there is a giant shortage of them. That bodes really well for your future in single family home investing. I just want to make sure our single family people hear that. Yeah, go ahead. To that point, actually, the governor of California recently sued Huntington Beach for not fulfilling its uh, construction. I, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. So there may be a backlash coming against this extreme zoning rules that yeah. that prevent the single family housing as there uh, should be from being yes. built. Yeah. But for the time being, there is something of a housing shortage in America. And for an investor in multifamily housing, uh, that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, no question about it. And an investor in single-family housing, too. That means we've got a limited supply. We've got a, uh, a population that needs a place to live. And we've got this shadow inventory. Do you have any stats or uh, information on that shadow demand? I, oh, I, I said shadow inventory. I meant shadow demand. In other words... The millennials usually living at home that will move into the housing market and have household formation. You said that the household formation's been pretty strong. The only thing I would love to see is, you know, something that would answer the question compared to what? And here's what I mean by that. The millennial generation, that cohort is so large, about 80 million people, that, you know, even if as a percentage, like on a per capita basis, they're not moving into the housing market and doing uh, household formation too much and, and they're, you know, living at home type thing. You know, just because their numbers are so large, it's going to seem strong, right? Compared to my generation, Gen X, you know, it's only 46 million people. I mean, we're like half the size. We're a tiny little generation or cohort. So do you have any thoughts on, on the percentage of the millennials or, or a comparison on that? I haven't seen well, much on that. I don't know if you do. Yeah, I don't. I can tell you that last year in 2018, 18Q4, about 32% of young adults 18 to 34 were living at home. And compare that to, let's, let's say, wow. uh, when, your gener- yeah. when your generation <laughs> might have been um, uh, in, in that age group, let's say 1990, mm-hmm. that was about 28%. Yeah. A four percentage point jump maybe doesn't sound like a lot, it's but a in lot. terms of the raw numbers, we're looking at, let's see, in 1990, you had about 18.5 million young adults living at home versus over 23 and a half today. Yeah, and and the funny thing is, there's really very little stigma attached to that anymore. Whereas in my era, and certainly the era before me, the baby boomers, that would have been just not cool (laughs) to be living with mom and dad. You know, you want to get out as as soon as you can and be independent. And and, and now, you know, it's, and the millennials like their parents, you know, a lot more than we did. (laughs) So, yeah. No disrespect to parents, but it's just kind of a different mentality. It really is. It's it's very interesting. And society is so much more portable nowadays, and there's so much more travel going on that even if you do live at home, it doesn't really feel like you're as stuck there. So it, there's a lot of factors at play. Before we let you go, let's talk about the segments of uh, you deal with a lot of institutional buyers. They're not buying as much class A stuff now as, as they used to, right? Because it's it's become pretty expensive. And you mentioned uh, off air before how they were going down market and, and buying some of the, the B and C uh, product, how that's pushing up the prices in that sector, right? That's definitely been a trend we've seen in the last uh, four or five years. So core pricing, that is pricing of, of your A plus product in downtowns and, and core metros um, has been pretty heady for the last few years. And a lot of institutional investors, the, the same as, as any other investor, have yields that they need to that they need to hit. So they have been traveling down market to some degree. And a, a good example of that is uh, the Prudential insurance deal that got done a few months ago. They bought about a billion dollars worth of workforce housing, that is uh, B and C properties. The yields on the on those B and C properties tend to be much healthier than your Class A stuff. And um, furthermore, one thing that we've we've noticed, especially for investors who are really seeking some additional boost to yield by going to uh, value-add properties, that is properties that are a little more poorly occupied, you do some work, you, uh, you bring the occupancy up, you get your yields, you get your IRRs a little stronger. Those poorly occupied buildings have at, the spread between a poorly occupied building and a well-occupied building in terms of pricing has come in a tremendous amount over the past four years. So someone looking to do that value-add prospect is now going to have to expect a little bit lower additional yield because 
you've got investors moving down the spectrum a good amount. Yeah, that's an interesting trend. It certainly is. Any data you want to share on cap rate expectations on the different product segments? I mean, you know, it depends on the city, obviously, but it does. just anything but, generally. But in general, our view right now is, is not terribly negative on cap rates. The spread between cap rates and triple B bonds, which we find to be a, a pretty good indicator, is actually pretty normal. And it, it doesn't feel normal, right? Because you're dealing with very low cap rates uh, relative to history. But you have to look at where everything else is priced to history. The spread between an apartment cap and a triple B bond is pretty normal. So even though even though you might be looking at a, uh, well, if you're an institutional investor, you might be looking at a four and a half cap, that's still a, a pretty decent spread over a triple B bond. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. So that that's a uh, common metric that is compared, like, you know, the institution could just do triple B bonds or they could buy an apartment complex. And that's yeah. how they think of that, huh? Yeah, that's, that's a pretty typical comparison. It's especially um, useful in office because in office, if you're buying a top rated office building, you're often buying a credit tenant. Doing the comparison between a credit tenant and a credit bond is, is pretty indicative. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, you know, with a bunch of individual tenants in apartment buildings, it's different. But kind of curious, though, why, why do they compare it with triple B rated bonds? Where did that come from? Like, is that the, is there some, there must be some comparison on the, you know, the way the investment's going to go and the risk associated with it is they're, they're sort of taking, hey, look, we can buy this uh, 200 unit apartment complex and it's about the same risk level as triple B bonds. What's the thinking there? It has to do with the uh, with the risk spectrum, the risk, um, the view on risk. Uh, so during a uh, during a, a bad cycle, um, you'll get a lot of investors rushing into what's perceived as the risk free rate, that is the ten year bond. But they'll abandon what is perceived as riskier investments, that is triple Bs and and real estate. Real estate can go to empty very quickly, if perhaps not multifamily, but if you're dealing with a with a company that if it's office or retail, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can very quickly go to no cash flow. So that's where that comparison comes from. It doesn't hold up exactly the same with multifamily, but certainly multifamily also suffers in a, in a downturn more so than a uh, more so than the so-called risk-free rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. You know, I've been saying for a while, and I keep sort of moving my prediction forward, and, you know, here, here's what I've been saying. The next 10 years, the demographics coming at the rental housing market are phenomenal. And, you know, for all these reasons, student loan debt and the portable, I, and no one talks about the portable society like I do, it seems like, but but I think that is a factor that people don't, they don't consider themselves you know, they just need a kind of a place to sleep, right? You know, they, they consider themselves much more portable. They can live in smaller units because all of our products have become so much smaller. You know, in the old days, if you had a stereo system, you had these big, huge speakers. I, this actually matters. I, I mean, I don't know. It may seem like a dumb little thing, but I, I think it does matter, this portable society concept. Um, I, I think people just view it differently. And so we've got all these different factors. We've got Gen Y coming up, and you know it'll be sort of interesting to see what they're like. I, I, none of us really completely know yet what how they'll act in the marketplace. But you know, is that still true? Do you think that the next ten years of demographics coming at the rental housing market are are really really bullish? Well, I've got a, a couple things to say there. So, so first, in terms of raw numbers, yes, let's call them Gen Z for now. Or sorry, Gen Z. Yeah, Gen Y is millennial. Yeah, <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> who can keep who can keep it tr yeah. straight? Um, yeah. But uh, Gen Z, in in raw terms, is just as big as millennials, and may in fact become bigger depending on on immigration uh, rules that that may or may not come into effect. But that aside, many of the things that you were talking about, um, particularly as it pertains to smaller units, kind of different living styles, I think a lot of that is, is driven as much by preference as by the raw economics of the situation. We talked about uh, millennials being burdened by debt, um, not necessarily earning as, as uh, highly as boomers did relative to where standard medium wage was 30 or 40 years ago. I think that that matters and, and has caused some of this, in effect, downgrading in lifestyles. Further, developers are always going to be looking for the best return on their assets, right? So shrinking unit sizes very much aids them as well. You get a higher 
price per square foot on a smaller studio than you do on a, certainly compared to a three bedroom unit. And kind of just the last, my last thought on, on that was that when it comes to that, that whole portable lifestyle, I think that you're by and large right there. But one important statistic is that millennials have actually been less prone to migration than, than boomers were as a percentage of, of population. I, I want to hear what you say about that, but I just want to interject. I would argue that they don't have the money <laughs> to move. Now, you know, I've always said the best thing you can have on a resume is mobility, you know, to be able to go to where the jobs are. But yes, I think there's a certain aspect of just the economic ability to move, number one. And Maybe, you know, another factor is just kind of some laziness. <laughs> you know? I, I complain about I millennials a bit, you know, but yeah. go ahead. So that does speak to what I was uh, saying, that millennials have proved less likely to move either for jobs or, or for opportunity than boomers. Why that is, I guess I couldn't fully say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, comfort level maybe is, is sort of a, ties in with the kind of laziness. You know, com just being comfortable. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I have this one client that says, you got to stop bashing millennials. I'm not really bashing them, you know. I mean, listen, my generation's got tons of problems too, okay. So, you know, right, right, right. It, there's just not 80 million of them to talk about as they're moving through the economy. So millennials are just going to get more press, you know. So that's the way it goes. Yeah, we're leaning on Gen Y to pick some of that. That up. Yeah, they, they'll pick it up in a few years. So don't worry, millennials. Okay. You'll, right. you'll you'll phase out here soon. Okay. <laughs> so, Andrew, any closing thoughts and uh, give out your website. Again, well, this is a CoStar Portfolio Strategy and we're an affiliate of, uh, of CoStar Group. So that's just uh, CoStar.com. In general, we do think that the multifamily and just the rental sphere in general is in pretty strong shape. The supply pipeline, that is the, the number of units under construction is somewhat worrisome. There's certainly a lot underway. But uh, we think that at the current rate that those have been completing, we've got a little more time. And when you say the supply pipeline is worrisome, that means not enough There's supply, a, right? I should say that there is quite a lot of um, luxury product underway. So for that top right. of the market, that is certainly a risk. And that I would totally agree with. I can't remember if we talked about that on or off air, but the high-end apartment market, lots of supply because that's they've been constructing that like crazy the last several years, right? They have been, and the vacancy rates reflect that. However, I will say that the stabilized vacancy rate for that luxury product is still quite good. It's, it's still very strong. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Andrew, very interesting talking with you. Folks, you know, this stuff is complicated. You've got to peel back the onion and slice it and dice it every which way to really understand the data, and then you're still left with questions. That's just the way it is. <laughs> so thanks for shedding some light on this, Andrew. Very interesting discussion, and uh, we'll look forward to having you back on in the future. No problem, Jason. Thanks again for having me. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.